Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, whatever time it is in Shanghai. Uh, I'm Aidan Walker. It is my pleasure and delight to be the Forum Programme Director uh, of the Design Shanghai Forum and indeed uh, Design China Beijing and Design Shenzhen, which is our new event this year. Um, I'm sitting in, uh, on the top floor of the North London studio of the man who is pretty much responsible for the whole theme of this Design Shanghai Forum, which is regenerative design. Uh, his name is Michael Paulin. He's a biomimetic architect, uh, although the more and more I've uh, learned to uh, have become to understand about Michael's work, the more I see that just an architect is really a very small word to describe a very innovative and important thinker in visual and in constructional culture, let's call it, the way we build things and the way we think about building things. Um, I first came across Michael's work uh, quite a few years ago. He has a book called Biomimicry and Architecture that's been just in its second edition now. Um, he is working on another book which we'll hear more about uh, as we speak over the next half an hour. Um, but as I say, the thing that, that really got me going to move from sustainability towards a more regenerative approach to design was Michael's own words where he said, sustainability is no longer enough. Michael, explain yourself. Well, first of all, thank you very much for that generous introduction. That's uh, very kind of you. So yes, I, I guess um, the 2018 issue of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report was a a turning point for a lot of people because it showed just how far adrift we are and how 30 years of sustainability had really not got us anywhere near to where we need to be. And, you know, the more I looked into it uh, with some of my colleagues, the more concerned I got, really, because the truth is that more than half of humanity's total greenhouse gas emissions have occurred since 1987, which is when arguably sustainability became mainstream mm. with the, you know, the Brundtland Commission yeah. definition and so on. And so, you know, 2018 forced me and many others to do some really serious thinking about, um, you know, where are we going? And I think that, you know, the key thing that became apparent about sustainability was that the, the implication of sustainability was that if you get to 100% sustainable, then all you've done is make it 100% less bad. And because most of what we do is well short of 100% sustainable, actually nearly everything we are doing is making things worse. It's part of a degenerative cycle. Right. And it's time to realize that that's, that's no good. We, we've got to get above that line of neutrality and find ways to create buildings, to shape cities and to manage landscapes so that we, we're having a net positive impact as a whole. And I'm absolutely convinced that's possible. I'm also convinced that when we get to that point of having a net positive impact, that will be a turning point for human civilization. That might sound kind of melodramatic, but I genuinely think that that's what we've got to aim for. I mean, I, I also personally believe, I, I believe that this is just about a, as big a thing as ever faced the human race, really, you yeah. know, right where we are now. Yeah. And that's shocking to hear that did you, what do you say, half the emissions that yes. we are now suffering from f since 1987? Exactly. So like in yeah. 30 years, less than 30 and, years? And there are some other worrying statistics. I mean, I don't want to dwell on the, the negative stuff. Yeah. We'll get well, on to what we can do few, about it. Let's just you know, horror but, stories. <laughs> exactly, just to set the context. Yeah. You know, in the last 50 years, we have extinguished 68% of the non-human animal populations on Earth. That's, that's how bad things are, are getting. Mm. And, you know, some people might say, well, you know, well, we've still got quite a bit to go. And well, the, 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 the truth is that ecosystems will start collapsing long before we get down to sort of 10% remaining or whatever. Yeah. This is a serious emergency. Yeah. And yet we still have a lot of economists arguing that endless growth is possible. Right. And if you, if you take, say, a 3% year on year growth, which is what a lot of economists argue is, is a healthy level of growth. Yeah in compound terms, that would result in a doubling of the global economy in 24 years. Yeah. And we're already bumping up against all sorts of, of planetary limits. So to think that we could carry on like that is, is nothing short of insane. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I think as we were just saying just before we started filming, um, it rapid, the conversation rapidly gets into geopolitics and 
political philosophy and yeah. how we live and the, you know the I mean dare I say at the end of capitalism and all those good things but let's you know pull back a little bit from that and begin to talk about your work which is which is inspired by nature which is biomimicry but yeah. uh, is there much of a difference between biomimicry and regenerative design or is it are they inherently the same thing and perhaps you could just unpack for us those ideas initial were the ones about biomimetics and is that different from biomimicry and sure. where biophilia fits in and yeah. all that good stuff. Yeah. You're allowed a long answer. <laughs> I'll need one. <laughs> all right, so um, just as there was a really healthy debate about what the ultimate in sustainability w would look like, and I'm thinking of sort of 25 years ago when we were having those discussions, mm. I think it's really important that we have that kind of rich debate now about what the ultimate in regenerative design is. And I'm currently working on a co-authored book with Sarah Ichioka, and we've been thinking about that a lot and also reading a lot of uh, books by people who've, who've been working in this area for a while. And, and the, you know, the sort of emerging uh, consensus is that ultimately what we've got to aim for is a state of co-evolution as nature. So we need to... Uh, end the sort of dualistic view of seeing humans as separate from nature, yeah. particularly the idea of nature as just some kind of externality that can be plundered for resources. Right. You know, that really is heading for a disaster. Yeah. But the, the ultimate in regenerative design is to get to a point where humans are actually part of nature, we're co-evolving as nature. Okay. And so within- When you say humans, I mean, you don't mean our physical beings, you mean our habitat, our exactly. environment? Exactly, yes, the, the way we, we live and the way we the way interact. We the earth, yes, exactly. The way we interact with the rest of the, the living world. Okay. And so it's essential that we start seeing ourselves as embedded within a web of life support systems. Right. And so th this will, I think, it change the sort of language that we need to, to use. So for instance, people talk a lot about um, natural capital. And it's important to think about the way that you frame things. That actually has a, a major bearing on the kind of behavior that emerges. If you refer to natural capital, then it implies that nature is something that can be liquidized if the cost-benefit analysis suggests that is worth doing. Yeah. I think it's, it's much more important to refer to, to um, nature as, as a web of life support systems. And, yeah. and we completely depend on those life support systems for our oxygen and water and food and medicine and so on. And you asked about how biomimicry fits into this. Well, I think from that definition of regenerative design, it's clear that we can actually learn a lot from looking at how the rest of the living world works. And what we need to do is to try and integrate all our activities into long-term stable systems. And so more and more people now are looking to biology for clues about how we need to rethink our ways of building, even our economies. So, you know, Kate Rayworth, uh, who's now a kind of rock star economist and, and absolutely deserved because her, her book, Donut Economics, is, is an absolutely, absolutely brilliant rethinking mm. of, of economics. Uh, she bases a lot of that on, on biomimicry. Um, and then in terms of some of the dis finer distinctions, I, mean, I think biomimicry and biomimetics are very similar. There are one or two people who, who make a distinction. So for instance, biomimetics has been used quite a bit by the defense industries to find more ingenious ways of exterminating humans. Yeah. Um, and so some people like to distinguish biomimicry from that and yeah. biomimicry is about uh, positive solutions. And then biophilia, that is, is more of a sort of psychological discipline in some ways. Yeah. Um, so that's about the idea that because we evolved in direct contact with nature, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that we are happier, healthier, and more productive if we're in regular contact with nature. Right. And then there's, there's one more, which I think is worth distinguishing, okay. which is biomorphic design, yes, yes. which is just about kind of mimicking the shapes Things of biology. Right. Yeah, and no. for me, that doesn't go far enough. We, right. need, okay. we need a kind of functional revolution. In okay. Way. So speaking of function, I mean, uh, you know, we, we need to get to the work because we need to be able to show some of the things that you're working on or some of the things that inspired you. We've got a, a variety of forms and, and uh, well, forms and shapes and organisms and things behind us. Um, where did the sense that you can mine the wisdom of nature, if you like, 
in, and put it into architecture. Where did that come from for you personally? Yeah. Well, as a teenager, I was passionate about three things, design, biology, and the environment. And I couldn't see the connections between those at that point. So I thought about studying biology at university and it, it didn't feel creative enough. So I left that behind. I studied architecture. And then some years later, uh, when I was uh, 30, I got a chance to join Grimshaw to work on the very early stages of the Eden Project. Okay. And I guess most architecture students of my generation had done a bit of, of biomimicry at college, but it tended to be a very limited number of examples, you know, spiders, webs, and termite mounds, yeah. about as far as it went. Yeah. So when I started working on the Eden Project, and particularly when I went on a short course run by two luminaries, Amory Lovins and Jeanine Bainews, yes. that's when I realised that the discipline was so much wider than that. Uh, and actually, for just about every challenge we face, there are going to be useful lessons that we can derive from biology. Because you know, life on Earth has, has evolved to solve a lot of those challenges. It, it's the result of a, a, an incredibly long and ruthless refinement process that has, has produced some incredibly well-adapted solutions. Yeah, I mean, I, think, I, I don't think that's a, a surprise to people, you know, but I think what is interesting is the transliteration, call it, of, the, of those ideas and of that understanding, that knowledge, into buildings, into sure. things, making things. Yeah. And I had this question, which, I, which you know, we have already discussed, which is to be a biomimicry bio architect, a biomimic, do you need to be a biologist or do you just need to hire biologists? Yeah. Do you need to be inspired by biology sure. or do you need to know biology? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you don't need a really detailed knowledge of biology. You just need to know enough to ask the right questions. Right. And, you know, I, th I think architects can be very good at that, you know, knowing enough about a whole range of subjects so that you can actually be a good collaborator. And, that, and that's the key, really. And I, I, I always like to work with people that are polymaths. You know, so those are the kind of people I, that I bring into design teams and yeah. always try to have a biologist as part of the design team. And was, and, and w w was the, the beginning of your practice as a biomimic, was that to do with the Eden Project? And was that where it all began to make sense in terms of structure and actually putting things on the ground that people that inhabited? Was, that, was, that was definitely a really key moment. And right. so I, I spent 10 years at Grimshaw and uh, worked with them on a number of other projects that explored ideas of, of biomimicry. And then came to the point where I, I, I wanted to be able to focus on it kind of exclusively. So I set up my company, Exploration, in 2007. Right. Um, and um, yeah, that, that's, that's been the focus since. And let's talk about um, the major projects from which, I mean, uh, the Sahara project clearly we have to talk about mm -hmm. because that's been going on a good long while, hasn't it? Yeah. And that was one of the first things when, you know, I read around, I, I don't know whether you know, I used to edit design magazines and things I read around and go, my God, what's going on here? Because we were still talking about sustainability. You know, I think you were already quite a long way ahead. Um, tell us about the Sahara project, about turning the Sahara into a place where water flows and green trees grow. Mm. <laughs> well, I, sorry, I need to interrupt you once, which is somebody told us, somebody told me, or I came across, it might have been you, it might have been one of your talks, that the Sahara used to be a forest. Well, it did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when Julius Caesar arrived, it was most of North Africa was covered in cedar and cypress trees. Yeah. And actually a lot of the world's deserts were like that. Uh, some far more recent. So a lot of Jordan was covered in, in quite low oak forest mm. until I think it was the mid 19th century when most of that was cut down by the Ottoman Turks to mm. build the Hejaz Railway. Yeah. And the problem with a uh, hot uh, environment like that is that once you take the trees away, it flips to a very arid um, region with very little biodiversity. Yeah. And it's very difficult to, to get that to, to go back. Yeah. But that, that is what we were trying to do with the Sahara Forest Project, um, with, with some uh, success. We were trying to get deserts back to, to a level of, of uh, greater sort of uh, biodiverse health. How? The, the key thing about the, uh, the Sahara Forest Project was bringing together technologies in synergistic ways. So looking at the way that ecosystems work, you have a a whole array of different species and they're all interconnected and interdependent 
and e healthy ecosystems are zero waste. They run entirely on solar energy. And importantly, they're regenerative rather than extractive. Mm. And I talk about this quite a lot in my book, Biomimicry and Architecture, that those characteristics of ecosystems are really good pointers for us to, to aim at. And that's what we were doing with the Sahara Forest Project. So the, there were three core technologies. There was forms of solar energy, mm. there was a seawater sea called greenhouse, and there was desert revegetation technologies. Mm. And when you bring those together, we found that they were actually more effective, more productive yeah. than, than when they're separate. So yeah. for instance, the shade created by the mirrors or the solar panels makes it possible to grow a whole range of crops underneath that would not normally grow in desert regions, simply because the solar intensity is, is too much. Right. And we built a version of that in Qatar that was yes. opened by the Emir of Qatar in 2012 during yes. the climate change talks. And that gave us a chance, that was called the pilot facility. So that gave us a chance to sort of twiddle all the knobs on the, the technical stuff. Yeah. And we added quite a few other technologies. So there was uh, salt processing, we were making materials from atmospheric carbon, uh, we were producing algae for biofuels and, and so on. So we actually had quite a cluster of technologies yeah. that was getting closer to the complexity of an ecosystem. Right. And alongside that, we also monitored what was happening to the biodiversity. And at the beginning, there was literally nothing there. It was just a bare patch of desert. Yeah. And literally the same day that we brought the first plants to site, we had the first birds appearing. Very soon after that, we had the first insects, grasshoppers and crickets. Yeah. A little while after that, we had the first butterflies. Yeah. And this is like five kilometers from the nearest patch of planting. Yeah. And as the plants got more established, we were getting more birds. We even had an appearance from quite a rare bird, a hoopoe, and, and we're getting mammals and, and so on. I need to stop you because I just need right. to ask you, how does that happen? Do the butterflies kind of say, there's a new forest over there, guys. <laughs> yeah, the word gets Let's around. fly <laughs> five kilometres. Or do they just appear? I mean, does it mean that their life forms are already there, dormant, and if the conditions are right, they appear? Yeah. I mean, how does that well, happen? I expect some of the insects came with the plants, yeah. but the, some of them were more baffling. I mean, I, I, I don't know where the butterflies came from, and also the dragonflies, which appeared within a few days of filling the algae ponds. Yeah. No idea where yeah. they came from. So, so yeah, it, you know, it is miraculous the yeah. way that nature can recover if you can just create the right conditions right. for it. Right. And, and in a way, the, the Sahara Forest Project was an example of, of the kind of thing that I wanted to do with exploration, because at the, at, when I set up exploration, I was convinced that the way to bring about change was through exemplar projects and, yeah. and getting uh, people to collaborate on uh, projects that may not necessarily exist as building types. And so, so we, were, we initiated that without a client, mm. because that's another obstacle, I think, to progress, that you know, this is kind of impasse where architects say, well, we can't do a really progressive scheme without a progressive without client, a progressive and, and client. clients generally won't ask for something if they don't know it's possible. And so yeah, on. yeah. So I and wanted to work in... I mean, am I right in saying that clients are essentially risk-averse because there's a lot of money involved? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, that's a fair assessment. Yeah. Yes. Because I do have a question here, which is about, about clients, about, you know, uh, again, I think I'm throwing my own your own words back at you, but to say you have to give the clients what they don't know they want. There, there's a slightly adapted version of something that Dennis Lasden said, which, which is, is, I think, as an architect, your responsibility or your duty is not to give the client what they think they want. It is to give the client what they never dreamed would be possible. Which is lovely. Yeah. But I mean, can you find clients like that? You know, because clearly you, you can't build, for instance, we're going to be talking about the office building, which which you've designed, but which you're looking for a client. Do you, do you already have clients who, who believe what you believe and who believe as passionately what, what you believe, passionately, yeah. Yeah. and who will put their money behind the kind of project that you want to build? Sure. Do you sure. have such people? Well, there aren't many, and, and I, I knew that when I set up. Mm. So what, one of the things that uh, I've kind of forced myself to get better at is public speaking. Mm. And that has given me an opportunity to speak at all sorts of events where people are going to find new ideas and, and it tends to sort of draw the, the most progressive clients. Mm. And, and that was the way I met the client for the biomimetic office. Uh, so he's a guy called Dr. Ralph Belm, uh, a real polymath, very progressive. And he, he had just finished uh, a green office building that had reached LEED Platinum. Mm. 
uh, and he, he became really uh, kind of, I wouldn't say the word obsessed, but uh, fascinated by, by mimicry uh, after one of my talks. And, and he said, you know, why don't you have a think and just make a proposal for how we could work together. Okay. It's a really nice sort of open brief yes. fr from a client. Yeah. And so I said, well, look, why don't we work together to use biomimicry to completely rethink office design? Yeah. Because I just have a hunch that we can go well beyond the scheme that you've just done that got yeah. lead platinum. Yeah. And so tell uh, us about the office of which we speak. Yeah, sure. So, so he said, uh, great, go ahead. Uh, I put together a proposal. I got together some of my kind of favorite collaborators, some of the best materials people and engineers and mm. biologists and, and so on. And thought very carefully about the, the right kind of collaborative process to get, to get the best out of that. Because I think there has been a tendency for the sort of so-called iconic architects to think that what they need to do is to do a sexy sketch on the back of an envelope and then expect the rest of the team to make make it happen. Yeah. And I actually think that's verging on insulting, particularly if you've gone to the point of selecting a really brilliant polymathic team. Mm. So I actually like the, the way that the conductor, Benjamin Zander, in his TED talk, talks about the role of a conductor, which is not necessary to make a sound at all, mm. but to make other people powerful. Yeah. the orchestra that is and to draw that together into a cohesive whole yeah. and so for me the, the the most inspiring model for an architect to follow is to be that kind of facilitator right. that, that draws the best out of a team and and then sees his or her role as as being a sort of unifier of of those all those sort of ideas yeah. and so we had a a really richly collaborative process and in the workshops we, we separated out all the different functional challenges of an office yeah. and then we looked at how those functional challenges have been solved in biology. Right. And one of the, the early ideas that, that came out was that we wanted to make this building as far as possible naturally lit, just, yeah. just using daylight. Yeah. So we looked at examples of how light is gathered and distributed in biology. Right. And several of these made their way into the building. And, and is, it was an interesting demonstration of how biomimicry can involve really quite complex science and sometimes it can involve really quite direct um, translations of ideas in biology into architecture. Yeah. So for instance, one of the more complicated examples was that we looked at a rainforest plant which lives in shady conditions and it, yeah. it's evolved lenses on its leaves that focus diffuse light, yeah. which is almost um, impossible to imagine because you know, diffuse light is inherently difficult to focus yeah. but it, it clearly it has done it because it lives in shade and it has lenses yeah and so this led to the idea that we're now are those are they like in in the leaves or it's not like drops of water on the leaves or anything? it's in the leaves and they're, they're really quite tiny okay. and they focus light onto the the chloroplasts which do the photosynthesizing okay the, so this led to the idea of harvesting light on the roof and focusing that into fiber optic tubes yeah so that we can conduct it around the building to where we want it yeah and we're now working on that idea. So you, so you get the whole building naturally lit. That, yes. Without yes. use of uh, yeah. the, of energy at all. Yeah. Without even needing the sun to shine. Yes. And uh, that, I mean that there is some complex science to that um, that that re requires some some fathoming. Okay. But another more straightforward example is that our biologist, his name is Julian Vincent. He pointed us to a fish called a spook fish. Yeah. Some of them have really entertaining names. Yeah. There's another one I could tell you about called the elephant nose fish, yeah. which is a, a real star. We but anyway, have a picture of the elephant nose fish. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the spook fish has what's called diverticular eyes yeah. that, that point up and down, and the bits that point down have have lenses. Sorry, not lenses. Uh, concave mirrors, yeah. which focus very low levels of light coming up from the ocean, bioluminescence essentially, right. essentially um, onto the, the retina. Yeah. And that gave us the idea of incorporating these two really large mirrors in the atrium, reflective surfaces that would bounce light into the lower parts of the building. Yeah. Because that's what we found when we analyzed the light levels. It was reasonably easy to get enough light on the top. Yeah. The challenge was how do we get the light further down? But you have to have what you're saying, if you're using the spookfish, you have to have the light coming up from underneath anyway to, to pick uh, up the not, not quite. We, we, just, we, we literally just took the idea of a, a concave surface which mm. can focus light. And so actually we were, we were getting the light coming down from the atrium roof and then these curved surfaces bounce the light 
into the lower parts of the office. Right. So uh, w as you speak, I'm thinking about zero carbon, you know, the whole yeah. idea of the zero carbon office, which I think, if I've co correctly understood you, where is sort of a, an old idea because all it means is that we're not consuming energy. So your biomimetic is regenerative in the sense that we're, we're are we putting energy back into the, into the biosphere, into whatever sphere it is? Because I, the next thing I think, if we talk about light, yeah. next thing I think, well, what's the next thing that people really, really care about in office buildings? It's air quality, isn't it? It's ventilation. Yeah. So how do we deal with that in a biomimetic way? Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, on the, the energy and carbon uh, uh, aspect, you're, you're right, zero carbon, that's from a sort of mindset of getting to neutrality. And w what we are trying to do with the biomimetic office is to get beyond that. So we're actually pr providing surplus energy. And that's only realistically possible if you can, first of all, drive down the energy consumption as much as possible. Yeah. So using natural light to light the building is one way of doing that. It's also yes. better for people because yeah. you're connecting into circadian rhythms and the natural variation of, of light quality right. over the course of each day. Right. And then we used ideas from biology to help us rethink the, the heating, the cooling, the insulation, the structure, even the, the fire safety, we were able to, to draw ideas from, from biology. Is there anything behind us, for instance, that... Well, that sure. Us? I mean, you, 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 probably nearly everyone is familiar with these because you see them in... in cuttlefish, I call yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can see them in um, budgery guard cages yeah. and so on. Yeah. And when you look at that under a powerful microscope, you find it has really quite an amazing structure because it's yeah. made up out of these very, very thin layers of bone which are connected together with these undulating walls. Yeah. And it's an example of how biology has evolved incredibly efficient and sometimes very complex structures that put the material exactly where it needs to be. And as a result, uses an incredibly small amount of material. Yes. And we use those ideas as, as well as, um, if you could pass that one, the bird skull, uh, that one, yes. Uh, this? That one, yep. This is a bird skull? Yes, that's a section through a bird skull. Uh, so this was another one we looked at. And, it, and it's an example, again, of a very uh, complex structure. So, so this is highly magnified. Ima yeah. Imagine a, a sort of dome yeah. of, of a bird like that. Okay. And, and it's, it's got these, these thin layers of bone that are connected together with struts yeah. and ties. So it's so like a, layers. So a bird, yeah. a bird has layers in, in the bone of a skull. Yes. Because they're so thin. Yes, and, and, and that's because with a bird, there's, a lot, there's been a lot of selective pressure on lightness. Yes. But at the same time, it's got to be strong to protect the brain and yeah. so on. Yeah. And we, we looked at examples like this to help us design the structure in a way that uses an absolute minimum of materials. Right. And then with the, the uh, fire safety side of things, there is actually now a, a, a new type of fire sprinkler head that's based on a beetle called the bombardier beetle yeah. and this sprinkler head produces an incredibly fine spray uh, so that it uses about a tenth of the amount of water and there are several advantages to that one is it does far less damage mm. if, if the if a sprinkler goes off and and also the the tank for the, the um, water can be a tenth of the size yeah so sometimes you can find these these kind of economic benefits okay um, anything else that really, really is crucially significant in the office building? Because the next thing I'm thinking about is the city in which the office building exists. And, you know, we're, yeah. we've got to talk about infrastructure there as well. But well, before we go there, is there... Yeah, sure. I mean, the, the other one that we were all proud of as a team was the glazing system yeah. that we came up with right. uh, that would achieve about a 50% saving in glass and about a 75% saving in aluminium. Right. And that was based on very simple ideas. You know, it's literally taking a thin material and, and curving it slightly yeah. so that it's strong enough to span, to span floor to floor without framing. Okay. And that's just based on ideas of curved leaves and shell forms in biology. So sometimes architects seem to think that ideas have to be complex in order to be clever. I, I'm not too fussed about whether it's yeah. complex I mean, no, or fancy. Just say, it's just about being effective. I was just going to say, surely somebody would have thought of that, wouldn't they? Make it, but I mean, maybe the technology, because this is another thing that interests me is that, you know, your conversation is shot through with ideas about technology, yeah. which 
conceptually, you know, is different from biology, isn't yes. it? Well, but there, there is, is yeah. there such a thing as biological technology or technological biology or something? I mean, curving a, curving a sheet of glass, we all know that makes it stronger. Pretty much everybody does. Yeah. I certainly do. Yeah. Therefore, it can be thinner. Therefore, it's lighter. Therefore, it uses less material. Yeah. So why isn't even that thinking standard, you know, yeah. in, in op well, particularly office design? Yeah. Does it mean, is it because everybody thinks in straight lines? Well, it, that one, it hasn't been done much before because it, it was a fairly new type of glass. But even so, it's a while now since we've done it. And, and we have tried to launch that as a product with various glass manufacturers and get it into other schemes and so on. And we haven't quite got there yet. And mm. that can be frustrating because, you know, the construction industry is incredibly risk averse. Yes. You know, sometimes I think people look at buildings that are quite flashy and think well that's incredibly innovative and yeah. actually no you it's know this yeah. architecture is not very innovative at the moment compared to other fields yeah yeah so okay compared to infrastructure design for instance because you know where i'm leading um, <laughs> i'm not sure i do leading to the dog vomit oh, slime right. okay. mold <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> which came up in one of your talks about i mean this is in, this is infrastructure design isn't it? it's transport networks actually so assuming that we are all using cars, regenerative cars like Thomas Heatherwick has recently been designing, um, or not even that, we're, we're all on public transport of some kind. Mm. Um, what about that? What about a, a city that needs to get people around with a minimum of, of waste, with a minimum of energy, from biomimetic building to biomimetic building? How, how does dog slime mould vomit, whatever it's called, dog vomit slime mould help us? Yeah. Well, it, slime moulds are quite amazing because they're single-celled organisms. Um, and, and you might think that a single-celled organism wouldn't be incapable, of, sorry, wouldn't be capable of solving a complex challenge. But actually, uh, they can. And what a slime mould does is it, it forms minimum distance networks between sources of food. And some scientists at Hokkaido University in Japan carried out an experiment with a map of the Tokyo region. And they put a little source of food on each of the towns and cities surrounding Tokyo. And then they put a slime mold on Tokyo itself. The slime mold spread out quite quickly. It located all those sources of food and then optimized the connections between them. And when it had finished, that layout exactly matched the railway network in that part of Japan. But whereas it had taken the engineers thousands of hours to arrive at that optimization, yeah. the slime mold, the single-celled organism, yeah. did it in 26 hours. <laughs> yeah. So, but the, but the railways were already built. They were. Yeah. So, so how, are we going to, how are we going to apply that kind of natural yeah. wisdom to systems? I mean, you keep talking about systems as well, and that's another thing. I know we're beginning to run out of time, but there's like too much to talk about. Um, what ha can we impose biomimetic systems on existing s infrastructural systems, yeah. or do we have to throw away that stuff and start all over again? How how are cities going to work? In yeah, sure. Well, um, we, we need to do much less in the way of demolition and rebuilding. So I'm not advocating that. Um, and you can still apply biomimicry to an existing building or an existing city. You just need to decide w what is sensible to keep and, and what options there are for rethinking things. Clearly, you're going to have options to go further with biomimicry if, if you're starting from scratch. And so, for instance, we did a proposal for a, a water treatment facility that was based on the efficient networks of branching systems in biology mm -hmm. and, and following a mathematical principle that mm -hmm. you can see in, in those branching systems. And we showed how we could uh, reduce the the friction in the pipework from a starting point of 100 down to below 40 just by using these these biological ideas and i think one of the the big transformations in existing cities that we need to bring about is is the way that we use resources mainly physical resources i'm talking about and getting cities to function much more like ecosystems so that if, if you imagine every building or um, activity in a city is the equivalent of a species and each of those has interactions with others and each mm. of, of them produces waste or underutilized resources. The challenge is, is how to get all of those things connected up 
so that we move towards zero waste systems. Mm. And there's actually scope for a whole new section of the economy that is the equivalent of what's called detritivores in, in biology. Mm. So those are all the organisms that um, dismantle, recycle, repair, and, and so on. Yeah. And that's what we need to be doing. And that, that actually will affect the, our kind of material culture as well, because we need to move away from materials that are very hard to recycle, yeah. move away from materials that have high energy bonds, and we're going to see a lot more use of biological materials because they're just inherently easier to incorporate into those ecosystem models and they, they, they involve far lower embodied energy. In fact, some of them take carbon out of the atmosphere. So yeah. that's another advantage. I mean, we're beginning to see companies like Nike do this kind of thing, aren't we? Uh, shoes, possibly, I'm not yeah, sure. There are some, okay. I don't know whether you'd call them biomimetic shoes, but I think using using natural or biologically or biologically inspired materials is well, definitely happening yes. here and there. Sure. But which actually leads me to a question, but, and, and I know we're coming towards an end. This is big stuff, Yeah. like just about as big as it gets. Where is where does the hope lie? Yeah. In terms of the of the the governments, the people, the companies, the corporations, that are um, that are essentially committed to the old way of living, the old yes. industrial age thinking of you know in continuous growth and so forth, which everybody knows at one level anyway that that makes perfect sense that it isn't it isn't sustainable. Yes. How do we make people think yes sure in the way that we need to think yeah yeah, yeah. well it's a it's a good question and a very important one and we were talking a few minutes ago about exemplar projects and how when i set up exploration i thought that was the way to bring about change yeah. the 2018 ipcc report made me completely rethink that yeah. and actually we're not going to get anywhere near to solving the planetary crisis just by producing exemplar projects. We, we actually need to be much more ambitious than that and mm. talk about paradigm shifts. And what I mean by a paradigm is a kind of widely held, uh, widely shared idea yeah. that, that determines to a large extent how society operates. Yeah. So for instance, a, a paradigm of endless growth, we need to rethink that. The idea that nature exists as something to be plundered, we need to re rethink that. Yeah. And that's what the, the book that I'm working on with Sarah Ichioka is about. So it's not about technological change so yeah. much. It's actually about changing the way we're heading and the mindsets that, that determine that. And that was inspired by uh, someone called Donella Meadows. So she was a systems thinker. And that was also the inspiration behind Architects Declare, which I jointly initiated with mm. Steve Tompkins. Yeah. And in the, the first chats we had in the pub, in late October 2018, we were talking about Donella Meadows and, and how to change paradigms. And we realized that actually what we have to do is to, to get um, a really broad coalition of architects and the construction industry as a whole to, to work together to try and shift these paradigms and to use that collective momentum to change the system at a higher level, to change the, the kind of rules of the game, to change policies and to change companies and we, we really do need to, to bring about fundamental change along the lines of changing the way companies operate. So at the moment, company law uh, includes what's called share, shareholder primacy. You have a, an obligation to, to satisfy your shareholders and yeah. to provide them with increased profits and mm. so on. That's a disaster. Yeah. It really, it, that is a disaster. That yeah. will head to collapse of our civilizations without exaggeration. Yeah. We need to do what the B Corp m movement is doing and have a duty for companies to, to reflect a, a, a much broader set of stakeholders. B Corp? Yes, yeah, a B Corporation. It, okay. it's, a, it's a movement um, it, it, and it involves a certain certification process and you have to be much clearer about what your deep purpose is right. and you have to demonstrate that you're being responsible to a much wider group of stakeholders. And by stakeholder, what I mean, and this is another thing that comes from the book with Sarah, is, is the idea that we need to rethink our role as, as humans and as designers. And, yeah. and in our book, we're arguing that our new role, our new purpose, should be to support the flourishing of all life for all time.
which sounds like a very good place to finish because I know we've got to finish. Uh, I know you're an optimist and I know that you I'm not. believe... Oh, aren't you? No, that's one of the chapters in our book, actually. Okay. So we challenge the idea of optimism and pessimism All right. because both of those imply a sense of inevitability about the future and you either feel positive or negative. Yeah. No, what you need to be is a possibilist. Okay. And that's what Hans Rosling talked about. You know, the idea that you need to decide on the future you want and then you need to set about creating it. And that means massively increasing our collective agency, our capacity to bring about change. Yeah, but it's possibilism. Possibilism. And, but, I mean, am I allowed hope, even? Because, yeah, 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 you know, yeah. the more you think about, we've got to do this, we've got to do that, we've got to do the other, and I'm thinking about the, the great corporations, I'm thinking about the four years that the United States has just gone under Donald Trump's presidency, you know, which yeah. everything's going backwards. Yeah. I, you know, I, we need hope, I need hope. Yes. And I need you to give me that in the next five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, too much of the communication in the environmental movement, I think, has been about negative stuff, about really alarming news, which tends to trigger the wrong part of your brain, yeah. um, which actually makes it more difficult to think creatively. And mm. the psychological research that Sarah and I have looked into suggests that the most mobilizing way of communicating is to give the, the real facts about what's going on and couple that as quickly as possible with something that you can do about it. So it's, it's being realistic and evidence-based as well as, as being hopeful that you can change it. Okay. I don't know whether there's another question about uh, the, the end there, like what can we do about it? Or have we already covered that? Well, I think the, the important thing we need to do is, is to recognize the, the paradigms, the mindsets that are holding us back yes. and work to transform those. Okay. And the key thing is to bring about a, a tipping point. So if you look at major social changes in history, often you find that there's a, a very, very slow pace of change and it looks like nothing's happening. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden it gets to a point where it, it ch changes dramatically to yeah. a new normal. Yeah. And so Polly Higgins, the, the late um, Polly Higgins environmental lawyer, she talked about visiting a friend in Berlin like six months before the war came down and saying to her friend's dad, you know, do you think the, the wall will ever come down? No, oh, no, no, that'll, ne that'll never happen in, yeah. in our lifetime. She revisited like three months after the wall had come down and the, the same friend's dad said, oh, it's always going to happen. Yeah. And what had happened there was the tipping point. You know, yeah. what had seemed impossible became, became impossible. In inevitable. Okay. And so we, we need to, to work to bring about a kind of tipping point so that what, what, what we see at the moment as the sort of seeds of hope for the future become quite rapidly the new normal okay. so that we can shift from sustainable to regenerative. We can shift from a mechanistic mindset to a systemic mindset, from an extractive way of doing things to a way of doing things that actually repairs ecosystems and re uh, reconnects communities and takes carbon out of the atmosphere and locks it up in buildings and a, a whole range of other positive things. I, I'm absolutely convinced that is possible. It's possible. Yeah. So we're possibilists. We are. Michael Paulin, thank you very, very much. Inspirationalist, I would say, not just <laughs> well, possible. Well, thank you. Thanks thank for you involving so me. Much.